very skinny. You look fantastic. You know that? Yeah. I didn't even recognize you back there. Morning, church. How you, how's everybody doing today? All right. So today, before we get started on our announcements, I do have a little something I wanted to share with you guys. Um, it may touch a couple nerves. Uh, so just bear with me on this. Um, but I think you'll understand where I'm going with this. Okay. So a while ago, I was with a group of men. And we were having a very passionate conversation about current events, all the things that were going on. And uh, the gentleman that was with me was a born again Christian, you know, and confessed that he is a follower of Christ and everything else. Um, and we were amongst other men and having this conversation. And he had said something that kind of made my head spin. He said it was his God-given right to own a gun. Now, I just want to repeat that. It's his God-given right to own a gun. So what do I have a problem with that? Exactly. He's a Christian. And the men knew he was a Christian. He's a follower of Christ, pro professed follower of Christ. And I want to make sure that everybody understands I don't have a problem with guns. I own one. I own several. Okay? I believe in our Second Amendment right, the U.S. Constitution. As an American citizen, I am very blessed that way. In fact, all of the rights in the U.S. Constitution I treasure dearly. So don't get me wrong about this. In, place, in fact, if it's, if it's bothersome, replace the word, replace guns with tortoise, okay? It's my God-given right to own a tortoise, okay? If that helps. Just to try to get it some context, okay? As a Christian, and bringing God into the conversation like this, you better be sure you have scripture to back it up. So, after our little conversation, I pulled him aside and I asked him, I said, listen, you know, do you truly believe this is your God-given right to own a gun? And he was still worked up, very passionate, yes, yeah, my God-given right. I'm like, okay. I said, well, you said it's God-given. That means God gave it to you, right? I think there's only two ways God would speak through you is either you're a prophet, which I don't think you are, or he wrote it, it's in the Bible, and is represented in the Bible. So can you please show me in the Bible, in the scripture, where does that say that? And he said, I, I can't. And I said, okay, let me remind you what it does say in the Bible. Under Deuteronomy, twice, it warns, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take, it, take away from it. Twice the warning is there. Once again, in Revelation, with a stern warning that says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. That's pretty harsh. If you're a Christian, Paul reminds you in 2 Corinthians, you are an ambassador for Christ. You speak on behalf of the Lord. And if you are bringing the Lord into a conversation such as this, you better have scripture to back it up. The question is, is if that conversation was happening and the Lord Jesus was standing amongst it, how would the Lord Jesus react when he heard that? Would he have been like, yeah, you go, boy? Or would he have been disappointed? As you being his ambassador. 
So I want to remind folks just the fact that we are Christians in a very dark time. We're seeing some really bad things happening in this country, and trust me, I am just as upset about it as anyone else in this room. But first and foremost, we have to remind ourselves we are ambassadors for Christ. First and foremost. And as such, in the dark world, we have to present ourselves that way. I think the Lord is more concerned about winning souls to him than our rights to own a firearm. Amen? Okay. Just wanted to share that with you guys. And again, it's not to poo-poo on guns. It's just simply to say that we have to remind ourselves of what, why we are here. Um, so anyway, let's get into the announcements. Enough of that. Uh, we have the Men Mentoring Men, not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday coming up. Uh, still working on the, uh, the uh, series by Nabel Karishi's video series. Yeah, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. No. Islam and, yeah, his... And so that's, that's some pretty exciting topics. So men, if you can make it, that's going to be Tuesday, May 4th. At, uh, I believe it's at 7 p.m., right? 7? Okay, yeah. Um, you could always join the men again. We were at, uh, on Friday mornings at 7.15 at Brits. Um, and we uh, enjoy a good time of fellowship and, uh, and food and, uh, and a study of the word. Um, also, Wednesday morning prayer meetings. Uh, pastor will be here at 10 a.m., uh, you can join him, and also on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., Pastor will be on Facebook and YouTube uh, to walk through or uh, his continued study of the names of God. Um, again, my plug-in from this morning's little discussion is the evangelism class of how you would best present yourself. Uh, I think that kind of leads into a nice little segue of what we were covering about guns and stuff like that. If you are interested of how you should be presenting yourself in an unbelieving world, I would highly recommend that you would sign up on that class um, and attend that class. The uh, tentative schedule is 5 p.m. on Sunday, May 16th. Uh, more information is back there. Um, there are some uh, tracks back there and there are some free books back there, so take advantage of that. Uh, then a reminder for those that are uh, for tithing, we also have for those that are here, we have the, the box in the back. We have um, the option that you can send in your tithes through mail uh, to Lakeland Bible Church at P.O. Box 7212, Lakeland, Florida, 33807. Uh, you can also do it through Cash App at 863-209-2280 uh, and also online through our webpage at lakelandbiblechurch.org. Uh, you can click on that and then click on the link. It's called Tidely. I can give that way. Uh, we do have two birthday announcements for happy birthday for Janet and happy birthday to Susan. Uh, Janet's uh, birthday is on, oh, I'm sorry, I mispronounced that, Suzanne. Okay, I'm sorry. So happy birthday, Janet. And ha um, hers is on April 26th and uh, Suzanne at uh, April 30th. And I believe um, that concludes these announcements. I'm gonna touch base just a little bit on the next proof of the Bible which is the Hittites. The Hittites uh, were an ancient people um, that existed around 1500 years. Uh, um, actually, it was around uh, 1600 to 1180 BC was the reign of their empire. But up until the uh, 1800s, people thought they were just an imaginary people. They didn't, they didn't realize that they actually existed. Um, there was a lot of scholars that dis, dis, uh, discounted that the Hittites even existed, even though it was mentioned in the Bible. So, when, uh, the, the, uh, so I'm gonna just read from here, but the Hittite capital was discovered, when it was discovered in 1834 by a French explorer, uh, all of that uh, doubt was thrown out. And yet another confirmation of archaeology and science proving the fact that the Bible is true, okay? Um, the ancient city, the capital city was Hattusa, 
Uh, it's found outside of uh, Bo Bogazkoy. Um, uh, it's a small village in uh, just, just outside of Ankara, Turkey. And Ankara, Turkey is, of course, the capital. Um, so uh, the ancient Hittites' large capital city was discovered about 90 miles east of Ankara, Turkey. The Hittite rule extended Syria and Lebanon. Although the Hittites are mentioned often in the Old Testament and almost nothing was known about them until the modern times. 100 years ago, critics thought the Hittites were just an imaginary people made up of biblical authors. Finding the Hittite empire forced that claim to be withdrawn and supported the biblical record. The find also helps explain the language, history, and literature of people who appear in the Old Testament and ruled in the second millennium. So there you go. Another proof of the Bible by science. Mr. Wall. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. The, uh, <clears throat> this time of year is uh, traditionally all around, the, well, all around the world. Springtime is the time when the, the sowers go out and sow their seed, uh, when the farmers get prepare the ground and, and put the seed in. And this morning I was reading in Galatians and uh, I thought it was uh, really spoke to my heart and I'd like to share it with you and uh, specifically where Paul is uh, referring to the, the Galatians but uh, in uh, chapter 6 and verse 7 when he talks about uh, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. He is not, you know, you, don't be misled. Uh, whatever we sow, we reap. And the importance of that is, of course, we need to sow good seed. And he goes on to talk about uh, sowing uh, the seeds of righteousness or the, uh, uh, if we sow to the flesh, uh, we reap that whirlwind of what that brings. And when it talks about the, 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 between the flesh and the spirit, and the flesh is the anger, the pride, the malice, uh, all of the, the bad stuff that we all carry because we're all sinners. But he said instead, so to the spirit. And the spirit is, of course, the loving kindness, the, the grace, and, and all that we have been shown through Christ is what we need to turn around and show to our brothers and sisters whoever, wherever they may be, are, you know, to love our neighbor as ourself. And, and, I, and I thank God that uh, in this time of year, and uh, as we know, there are many going out and sowing. May we all take this opportunity to sow kindness and to sow the good seed, and uh, we will reap a harvest of, of blessing by doing so. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank you, we praise you, you are the giver of all good gifts. And Father, among those are the opportunity through your spirit, Father, to sow seeds of righteousness and goodness. And Lord, we thank you for that opportunity that you give us daily to make good choices, daily to set our hearts and our minds to do your will and not our own. Father, we thank you that you have given us your spirit as down payment of what is to come. And we know that that day will come when we will be able to stand before you, and not because of anything good that we are personally have done, but, Father, only through the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ will we be able to stand before you unashamed. And, Lord, we thank you for that precious gift and that precious promise. And when your son said that, of all those that you have given me, Father, I have lost none except that one that was destined for perdition. Lord, I thank you today for your word that encourages us, that warns us, that, that builds us up and gives us that precious hope of what is to come, that we will one day reap if we don't fail to sow those seeds of kindness and goodness. Lord, I just pray for uh, Pastor Mike today as he brings your word and for pastors everywhere that are bringing your word I pray that uh, as they speak that those words will penetrate the hearts that need to be penetrated will crumble the hearts that are hard 
but Father will build up and encourage the hearts that are weak and need to be encouraged. We thank you, Lord, that your, your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it'll cut away that which needs to be cut away, but Father, it heals at the same time. And I thank you for that healing touch, and we thank you for your amazing grace. And it's in Christ's blessed name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Walt. I'll let the kids go. Thinking about what you said earlier, Pete, um, truthfully, we don't even have the God-given right to breathe. <laughs> Our lives are a gift from God. And, uh, and so we can be thankful for the grace that, um, that not only gave us life, but also gave us life in Christ. And we know for sure, because of the authority of God's word, that we will spend an eternity with him, so we can rejoice in that. A couple of things I want to point out with this evangelism class. Tentatively, I put for, this, uh, for the 16th of May, 5 o'clock. So uh, I just said tentatively, uh, and if you signed up for the class, if you've got a problem with that, I'm open to change, but uh, we'll try to do that. And, uh, and so if you've got a problem, let me know, and we'll see what we can do. If there's enough of you that need a different time, we'll, we'll reschedule that. But anyway, concerning these books, I want to encourage you, if you haven't got one, pick them up. They're great books. They're, they'll be good uh, preps for the course. Um, and then, of course, going along with our message this morning, Chapter 3 of this book, One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven, Char Charles Haddon Spurgeon says this. He says, if there, if there be any one point in which the Christian church ought to keep its fervor at a white heat, it is concerning missions. If there be anything about which we cannot tolerate lukewarmness, it is the matter of sending the gospel to a dying world. And so that's always got to be a priority for us um, because the world is lost. And there is no hope without Christ. And so we want to look this morning at <clears throat> the Holy Spirit and missions. And in chapter 13, you remember this chapter presents a major turning point in the church that we had mentioned. Uh, up until now, the church in Jerusalem was the focal point of ministry. They had been uh, focusing on the ministry of the apostle Peter and the mostly Jewish church. There were some Gentiles that had come to faith in Christ, um, but uh, God had to convince Peter in a vision that the gospel was always intended for uh, Gentiles as well. And then when he went to Jerusalem, Peter had to convince them that the gospel was also for Gentiles. And of course, they had enough evidence in the Old Testament scriptures that the gospel was always uh, available and was there for the, um, for the Gentiles. Uh, in, in Isaiah chapter 49, that's a messianic passage, and in that passage, in that chapter, the Lord is called my servant. And of course, ver verse, uh, verse 6 says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And then, of course, you remember the Abrahamic covenant when God made that promise to Abraham. He said, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So that just kind of assumes that all the Gentiles are included in that. And then, of course, in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 11, it says, um, for from the rising of the sun even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, in every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name. Uh, for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. And of course, we also know that in glory, in the book of Revelation, there's that scene where all the saints are gathered together and it's from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And so we really need to understand that, and, and Peter had to make the Jewish believers understand that the gospel was also for the Gentiles. And that's where we transition now. Um, of course, he had to give Peter a little nudge, and, uh, and then he had to convince the church in Jerusalem that the gospel was for the Gentiles. Then we saw Peter getting arrested. You remember that 
He was uh, under arrest and he was waiting to be executed by order of King Herod. And then God intervened, miraculously uh, released him by an angel of the Lord came and put all the guards to sleep. And of course, they uh, paid with their lives for that. Of course, that was to no fault of their own. But, uh, but then after that, we see uh, Peter release, and then he has to kind of make himself scarce because, after all, Herod really wants him dead. He thinks that he can uh, gain some favor with the Jewish people and the Jewish leaders if, if he can get Peter out of the way. Um, and so that is his desire. So Peter disappears for a while, and we won't see him again until we get to chapter 15. Um, and then we see at the end of chapter 12 that that God has to bring swift judgment on Herod because Herod actually steals glory from God. He is, uh, he, he is in Tyre and Sidon and he's speaking to the people and they tell him, you're the voice of a God and they're just kind of heaping all this praise on him and, and he's accepting it and he's receiving all this glory to himself and of course the Lord brought swift judgment because he was eaten on the inside by worms. The, the word actually in the Greek refers to a tapeworm. Um, and the historian, the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that it took five days for him to die an agonizing death. And so, uh, so he uh, loses his life. And that's how chapter 12 ends. And then, of course, the final word um, tells us that Saul and Barnabas returned to Antioch after taking some relief to the saints in Jerusalem. Now, we pick up in chapter 13. And of course, you remember the, the Lord Jesus when he, before he ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the end of the earth. And so now we see that Jerusalem is no longer going to be the focal point. It's going to switch to Antioch now. And Antioch is going to be the missionary hub of, of the world right now. And that is where the outreach is going to be uh, centered. This is, uh, this is the impact of the Holy Spirit being in charge. Uh, the Holy Spirit in missions, as I titled it, is because we need to see that the Holy Spirit, when he is in charge of our lives, he, one of the things that he puts within our heart is a passion to know the Lord Jesus Christ. But in addition to that, it is also a passion to make him known, that we want others to hear the gospel. That should be our heart's desire. That's why we want to do this evangelism class, so that we can learn how to share our faith with others. Um, if we're surrendered to his spirit, that one who indwells every believer, um, then he will give us that desire to see people saved. And the church at Antioch has all the ingredients necessary for God to work and, and to raise people up so that they can bring a, um, a, a, an effective missionary team and send them out. And we'll see that that team consists of Barnabas and Saul. But they can begin spreading the gospel unto the end of the earth. And so in uh, Acts chapter 13, excuse me, um, and I want you to, as we read through this, pay attention to the activity of the Holy Spirit as, as he's mentioned here. Verse 1 says, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bargesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, 
seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now as we begin to unpack these verses, we will see the Holy Spirit is in charge. He is the one that is leading this church to engage in the ministry of missions. And uh, they take the gospel to the Gentiles. And we see several proofs, several evidences of the Holy Spirit's activity there and um, as he is in control of the saints. And the first thing I want you to realize that in this church, there was biblical teaching. We see that in, if we go back to Acts chapter 11 and verse 25 and 26, it says there that Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. That must have made an impression because the word Christian literally means little Christ or Christ follower, Christ ones. And so Paul or Saul, he'll also be called Paul and we'll see how that begins, to, how that takes place later on in our text here. But Saul and Barnabas, they discipled them for a whole year, teaching them, giving them a solid foundation so that they can get grounded in the word. And when Paul later wrote to the Ephesians about the church, what he mentioned to them was that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Now, that's where a good church ministry has to begin, with good biblical teaching. And there are a lot of churches today where they've kind of strayed from biblical teaching. They tell a lot of stories, they have a lot of illustrations, they do a lot of all kinds of things. But... Uh, to be solidly grounded in the word of God, the churches are disappearing from our view. And, uh, and what we see today in our country is sort of a, a very shallow pseudo-Christian uh, evangelicalism uh, that has emerged. Uh, yesterday, um, I was, I was uh, on my computer and I got a notice that somebody had private messaged me uh, and they were inquiring about the church. Apparently, they had saw the, had seen the uh, the um, Facebook page, and so they asked me about a detailed doctrinal statement. That really thrilled me because I love it when people ask for doctrine, and so naturally I put it together and I sent it to them because on our website all we have is that little a little ten point outline I believe it is just kind of an abbreviated version of our doctrine. They wanted the complete thing so I sent that to him but that just tells me that doctrine is important what we believe is extremely important because what we do will flow out of what we believe and if I'm believing the wrong thing then I'm probably going to be doing the wrong thing so doctrine is extremely extremely important and that's the reasons why we have uh, the men's Bible studies and the women when they do their women's Bible studies in the children's church and we want to get these ministries for our young people because we need to be grounded in the word of God. That's where we, that's where we find what God wants from us. That's where we get fed. That's how we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we truly, we need to uh, provide more um, my spiritual father, I wanted to bring this to you and show you. It's been hanging in my office. And not all of you have been there. But this is a calligraphy that my spiritual father gave to me at my ordination, which was 1987. That's what, 30-something years ago? 33. 
Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, but it, but it, it says, "You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses." Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And as he gave that to me, I considered that as a charge to ministry, to teach others so that they can in turn teach others. And that's how the church kind of perpetuates itself. We pass it on to the next generation, and that generation passes it on to the next generation. And so we teach, and we continue to teach. And, um, and so Paul told uh, Titus, he says, uh, as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Sound doctrine, sound biblical teaching is extremely critical. Um, and you will find it when the Holy Spirit is in control. So, from that, and, and then from our text, getting back to our text, the next thing that you'll find is godly leaders. Verse 1. It says, Now in the church there was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, and uh, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and then Saul. So you have five men that are identified there, and Luke identifies them as prophets and teachers. So the teaching continues. Um, in the early church, a prophet was someone who spoke as they received new revelation from God. If you remember back in chapter 11, um, in Antioch, a prophet named Agabus came and he prophesied and told them that there would be a famine taking place in Jerusalem. And that's when they took up a collection and they sent Saul and Barnabas down to Jerusalem with relief. And now this is, they've come back after delivering that, that gift to them. And, uh, and so the prophets were typically given practical revelation of things to come. And, uh, and of course, Often what would come with the prophet was not just things to come, but also a call to repentance. That was typical of the prophet's ministry. Um, but remember we said that the gift of prophecy was temporary and it ceased with the other sign gifts. Now that we have the word of God, we don't need these uh, sign gifts. And if there is an equivalent today, it would be the pastors and the evangelists who preach the word. Uh, Peter refers to it as the prophetic word. And then, of course, there were teachers who would actually teach, and what they did was they just give the understanding of Scripture. They teach the saints so that they can understand what the Word of God is teaching. And so Antioch had five such men of God that, uh, that this church, um, so they were well equipped uh, to be able to feed the saints, to teach the saints, so that they could all grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Now, we already know about Saul and Barnabas. We've said quite a bit about them. But these other three, we don't know a whole lot about. The first one he mentions is Simeon, who is called Niger. Um, now, more than likely, he was black. The name Niger actually means black, so it's believed that he may have been from Africa. There are some who believe that he was the Simeon who actually carried the Lord's cross. You read about that in Mark chapter 15. There's really no evidence to say whether that's true or not, but some believe that it could be. Um, we just don't know for sure. Lucius was actually from Cyrene, so he was from Africa, and Cyrene was a, a, was a city in the northern part of Africa. And then we see Menaean. Menaean was raised with Herod Antipas. Uh, he was the one of the Gospels. You remember we mentioned him last week. He was the one who was... Um, who had John the Baptist beheaded, and he was there when the Lord Jesus uh, went on trial, and he mocked the Lord Jesus. And so we see how that took place, and, uh, and Manan apparently, he grew up with him. And, and so the early church, they came together, and, uh, and they taught, and these men um, were able to teach the word of God and pass on to the next generation. One of the things that, um, that I find from this is the guy Menaean was raised with Herod the Tetrarch. Now that's an unlikely friendship. I don't know if there was a friendship or not. They were raised together, more than likely they were. But the fact that Menaean became a believer and a leader in the church really gives hope that the, that the grace of God can reach anybody. 
if he reached into the, the royal family of Herod and, uh, and touched this man, Manan, and he became a believer. So there's always hope for God's redemption, really, no matter where they come from. And so Manan is sort of evidence of that. There's a great missionary pioneer to India and Persia. Persia is now modern-day Iran, uh, named Henry he once said that the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions, and the nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we become. And Saul and Barnabas had already demonstrated that they had this missionary spirit, but why? Very simply, just because they were filled with the spirit. The spirit of God had given them that passion in their heart to go out and preach the gospel. And, uh, and so they developed this same passion to reach others with the gospel as, past, as uh, prophets and teachers. They would have passed that passion on to others. And the same is true for Lakeland Bible Church. If, if we want that passion to infect the church so that all of us go out sharing the gospel, we have, Pete just kind of challenged us this morning. We saw the passion coming from him as he encouraged us and challenged us about witnessing um, the evangelism class. Walt and I and Jim and Pete and Jadel, we, we have to demonstrate that as leaders because the church isn't going to be doing it if we're not doing it. And so we find that that was present there in the early church. And, uh, and so the next thing that we see is in this church there was meaningful worship. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Now, a church of the Spirit led is going to have meaningful worship. Meaningful worship is a, is a very misunderstood term today because uh, meaningful worship today is very emotional based. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with emotion. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna downplay anybody that experiences emotion in their worship. But when we worship the Lord, we have to remember, he says they ministered to the Lord and fasted. That's where our worship is aimed. It's not about what I can get out of it or what music I like or all those other things that we generally associate with worship. It actually has its source in the heart of the worshiper. What am I going to offer to my Lord? He's, he's the audience of one. When we come together for worship, I am offering my heart to him in praise and adoration. And so what I get out of it is really irrelevant. And, and of course, when you see the leaders, the godly leaders, what's their responsibility? The word of God and prayer. They minister to the Lord in that way, uh, and they were passionate about seeking the Lord and serving him because they were filled with the Spirit. But you just notice that they ministered to the Lord, not to the people. Um, the word ministered there is in the present tense, so it has the idea that this was something that just continually happened. They, uh, they did it all the time. And then it says they fasted. Fasted is kind of a lost experience for a lot of Christians today, too. Fasting, um, denying yourself food so that you can gain some spiritual uh, advantage in your relationship with the Lord. They sensed the urgency of the situation, and they sought to draw near to God. And the early church would fast and pray because they wanted to see God answer prayers. They, they wanted God to give them power to serve and to preach and to proclaim the gospel. They wanted the Lord to, to, to bless them so that they could see souls saved and lives changed. They denied the physical so that they could fo focus on the spiritual needs. And so they were willing to deny themselves to see God's work done. We live in a culture that knows very little about denying the self. And, and it's, it's a practice that we should discipline ourselves to engage in, to, not, to deny ourselves. Now, I'm no, I'm no expert on fasting. I've done it, you know, I can count on two hands the number of times I've really fasted as far as wanting to draw near to the Lord. But it, it's a wonderful experience when you can do that and you can focus your attention on the Lord and, and, and not think about <laughs> all the other things. It's, it's, uh, and, and the Lord says that he wants to find people who worship him. 
Remember he told the woman at the well in John 4, 23, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. Well, why does the Father seek such serious worshipers? Well, very simply, it's because that's the way that we glorify him. That should be what our main focus in life is all about, to glorify the Father. It's, it's what he deserves. So worship is not about what you want or what you expect from the Lord. It's about what he desires. It's about what he deserves. And we make a big deal about the types of music and the style of worship that we like and what we get out of worship. But God is more interested in the heart of the worshiper. That we humble ourselves before him. And we worship in song as we sing. We, we lift our hearts to the Lord and we're singing to him. We want to please him. And as we, as we praise him, I said it's not really about what we can get out of it, but one of the things that you'll discover when you really lift up your heart and you worship him sincerely and, and fervently, you will experience his presence. Uh, Psalm 22.3 says that the Lord inhabits the, present, the praises of his people. You will experience that when you are truly worshiping in spirit and in truth. And so, you know, one of the things that you hear a lot about, and for me particularly as a pastor, is a lot of, there's a lot of talk about pastoral burnout. Um, and I guess I, in, a, in a way that I've experienced that to some degree from time to time. But what I have really experienced and learned as I've grown in the Lord is that those times really are intensified when I have kind of neglected my personal worship my time with the Lord. See, because that's when he begins to fill me. He begins to, to, to strengthen me, to fill me with his grace and with his spirit when I'm worshiping him. And if I can neglect that, then I'm, I'm going to be starving myself. And so we need that personally. And, uh, and so we need to draw near the Lord in worship. The spirit-filled church is a strong foundation built on solid teaching with godly leaders and meaningful worship. And out of those things, will come faithful outreach. Notice that the Spirit of God sovereignly directed the church here about who they needed to set apart to go and preach the gospel. Flowing out of their worship came the guiding of the Holy Spirit with a plan for spreading the gospel. Um, would you notice, though, that it happened as they were ministering? That's how the Lord revealed his will to them. Um, as they were ministering to him, blessing the heart of God, he revealed his will to them. And we mentioned this before, but God's not going to dust, you know, dust the dirt off of Christians who aren't really engaged in worship and who aren't actually serving him. He's going to find the saints that are busy, that are, that are devoted to their worship of him, and they are serving him faithfully. Those are the people that he's going to raise up and send out to serve him. He uses the ones that are in the middle of serving him, the ones that delight in doing what pleases. And you notice here, he takes what is best. Now, we don't know much about Simeon and, uh, and, and Lucius and Menaean, um, but they set apart Saul and Barnabas. Now, I'll tell you something. If, if we as a church are going to send somebody out, and we had a Saul and a Barnabas, my desire would be for them to stay here. Send the other guys out. We need them here. Um, but, but God took the best. Now, that's not, to, you know, that's not to say anything about the other guys. I'm sure that they were godly men, and they were gifted as teachers as well. But we, we know the reputation of Saul and Barnabas. And God said, separate them and send them out. So it's a work that God had called them to. Paul said in Ephesians 2 that God saved us by grace through faith. The reason he saved us, he says, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I memorized this in King James Version. So some of that gets mixed up in there a lot of times. But he saved 
us by his grace, and he works in us by his spirit to work in us, and then he directs us to do the work that he wants us to do. Peter, or Paul rather, says in Philippians chapter 2, he says that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. In other words, the Holy Spirit who is in me is working, and he is busy actively helping me grow and mature, feeding my soul, and he's charging me so that I can go out and spread it out to others, and he directs me as I submit to his will. And uh, we work it out for him. God works it in by his spirit and his word, and you and I work it out. And if we're not filled with the spirit, then we're going to miss out. The work that God had designated for Saul and Barnabas was to reach out to the Gentiles. So the church recognizes them, and they call them. They set apart. They're praying and fasting, and it says they lay hands on them. Now, laying hands on them was just a way of identifying them, uh, identifying with them, rather, and demonstrating that, that they confirm God's choice and that there is a unity among the brethren here as they send these two out in mission. And, uh, and, of course, they take a young man named John. Uh, he's also called John Mark elsewhere. Um, but they take him with them. So we should be aware that when we're doing God's will, you can also bet that something else is going to happen. There's going to be spiritual opposition. Look at verses 6 through 8. It says, Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God, but Elymas the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So in Paphos there was this official. He was a governor, and he sent for Saul and Barnabas. He wanted to know more. But one thing you can always count on when you are actively serving the Lord, Satan doesn't want you to be successful. He's going to do whatever he can to try to upend you, to try to ruin you, to try to destroy you, to try to interfere with what God is doing. And here he has a sorcerer named Elymas, and he's called a false prophet, and he tries to convince Sergius Paulus not to believe their message. Now, you need to understand, whenever you set out to reach a soul for Christ, you can be sure that hell wants to put a stop to it. The devil does not want to lose any more souls. And so being in ministry, if we're out there busy, actively engaged in missions and ministry and evangelism, just be warned that it's a spiritual warfare. It's a battle. And we will come against spiritual opposition. We're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against uh, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in dark places. There are unseen spiritual forces at work behind the scenes, and they work through people. Pete mentioned the condition of our country and things that are going on right now. Those are the things that we can see what we can't see is what's really causing all of this. There is a spiritual realm that we can't see with our eyes, but they are the ones that are affecting, infecting, if you will, the world and our country. Tony Evans said this, and I, I just clung to this quote. He says, if what you see is all you see, then you do not see all there is to be seen. Um, that, that's so true. He said, everything visible and physical is preceded by something invisible and spiritual. So if you want to deal with the physical, sp visible problem, you must identify the invisible spiritual cause. So when we go out and we're witnessing, we are, we are dealing with the cause. It's the hearts of men that are darkened by sin, that are darkened by Satan. Satan has blinded the minds of them that believe not, and they are influenced by spiritual forces. You and I, we go out with the gospel, the light of Christ, and as we share, we're going to encounter this opposition. Saul knew that there was more to this false prophet than meets the eye. By the way, the name Bar-Jesus actually means son of a savior. 
And of course, Elymas has already said that means sorcerer. But here, he's Satan's emissary, and he's a smooth-talking, turncoat Jew, and he had rejected the God of Israel. So he's just another false prophet, and he's attached himself to the leader of Paphos. And he's found a place where he has influence and he has power, and he doesn't want to lose that. Sergius Paulus wants to know more about the truth, and Elymas doesn't want him to find out because he knows that'll be his end. More than likely, he kept this sorcerer close by because it was common in those days for leaders to be superstitious, and so they would have wise men, magi, magicians, uh, spiritual counselors, if you will, that could help advise them. And that was the, that was the role that Elymas played here. And so what he sees with Saul and Barnabas, he tries to step in and keep keep them from being effective with Sergius Paulus. They don't want him to come to know the truth. And so uh, we need to be aware that there are many outside influences, spiritual influences that deceive people, keep them from coming to know the truth. And when we're trying to bring them into truth, there's going to be a spiritual battle. But we need to realize greater is he that is in, that is in us than he that is in the world. But now that presupposes one thing, that we are surrendered to him. If I'm not letting the Spirit of God control me, then the devil's going to have a heyday with me. He's going he's to have a field day with me. He's going to have, he may have his way. But when I'm spirit controlled, when I'm yielded to the Spirit of God and I'm surrendered, then the Spirit's in control and he can combat the enemy. The enemy is no match for God. And so when you're filled with the Spirit, you will experience spiritual victory. It says, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, and by the way, this is where he begins to be called Paul. Um, don't make the mistake. Some people think that because he was saved, his name was changed from Saul to Paul. His name wasn't changed. His name was always either Saul or Paul. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Roman name. But now we find that Luke begins to refer to him as Paul because he's going to be out mostly reaching the Gentiles. Now he does, you will see as we see here, that when he goes out, the first thing he does when he goes into a city is he goes to the synagogue. But there's going to come a time when he it keeps being rejected by the Jews that he's going to just kind of dust the, you know, wipe the dust off of his feet and he's going to focus mainly on the Gentiles. But it says here, Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of the righteous, of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight way of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And so... It's important for us to note that Luke says Paul was filled with the Spirit. That is, the, that is why he was able to discern the spiritual battle here, the enemy. That's the basis for his victory over Elymas. The Spirit gave him discernment that he needed to come against the spiritual enemy. So if we're walking in the flesh, then, then be forewarned. If I want to walk in the flesh, then I'm no match for the enemy. Um, he will defeat me every time. That's why we need the Spirit. And of course, Paul says in Romans 8.37, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Elymas was a false prophet. He was afraid of losing his influence, afraid of losing his power with Sergius Paulus. But the spirit-controlled apostle knew what was really going on, and so he just got in his face and called it like it was. You know, he, he, he said, you know, he, bar Jesus means son of a savior. He said, you son of the devil. And, and, and so he just called him out. Instead of being a promoter of righteousness, this magician was trying to make a straight way of the Lord crooked. And so this, the Spirit led Paul to pronounce a curse on Elymas that clearly exposed the spiritual reality of what he was facing. And so again, just the importance of being spiritual, spirit-filled. And Elymas was spiritually blind. 
And so that was his spiritual condition. And so God said, okay, let's make it your physical condition too. And he put a fog over his eyes and he couldn't find his way around. He had to find somebody to lead him. So the general point of this victory is that we must be filled with the spirit to be victorious over spiritual enemies. We're not able to defeat them on our own. And if we don't stay filled, we'll fall short of our purpose and our calling and we'll flounder in our walk with the Lord. And uh, because we operate in the flesh, if I'm not filled with the spirit, then it's me doing it. And, and you know, I, sad to say, there are still times that it's me doing it. And I don't, and I'm not trusting the Lord and I'm doing it all in my own energy. And I, and I get frustrated and, 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 I, and I have to be reminded by the Spirit of God that, of course, Mike, you're going to have problems. Keep doing it on your own. If you don't need me, fine, I'll sit back and watch. And uh, it's one of those lessons, unfortunately, that we have to keep learning. And when people hear the truth from us and they see the power of God being manifested through our lives, through our boldness, through our godly character, then what happens is we capture the attention of people that are observing us and we'll see miraculous conversions. It says here, the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now, truthfully, any conversion is a miracle. Whether you were raised in church and you're born again, you've been in church all your life. I remember when, uh, when I was in Bible college, there was one of the young guys, he went out doing evangelism, and he came across a man who was 70 years old, grew up in church. The man realized that he had never been born again. He said, I have even gone out witnessing. He said, but I've never been born again. And so that was a miracle for God to open up his eyes. You know, he was steeped in his religion, but he really wasn't converted. And so when, when, when God saves somebody, he doesn't make bad men better. He makes dead men live. And so it's always a miracle. The Bible says that Satan has blinded the minds of them that do not believe. And God wants to use us to open their eyes so that they can see the truth. I love what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul shone the light of Christ. Elymas wanted to keep uh, Sergius Paulus in the dark. But Paul says this, he says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them, for well, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, <clears throat> I mention this frequently, but every time I think about spiritual darkness and spiritual light, I, I can't help but think about uh, Scott and Jenny Phillips because they gave up the comfort of living here in this country and they went to the jungles of Indonesia up into the mountains and, and they took the light of the gospel with them <clears throat> and they took it into this spiritually dark place where the Tao people lived and they were steeped in their animism and their spiritual darkness. And it wasn't until they had actually been able to learn their language and they began to put the word of God into the Tao language that the Tao began to understand and they saw the light of Christ and they were converted. And now the light shines brightly and the Tao are taking the light of the gospel even further, deeper into the jungle and the darkness that's there. And so they've got their own evangelists. And so <clears throat> there's a whole people that was once steeped in darkness and now they're taking the light into their part of the world. And uh, it's just an amazing thing to see. And, and for us, it's a privilege for us to, to be involved in supporting that ministry and praying for that ministry. Um, but, you know, that's on the other side of the world. And we have a hand in that, but here in Lakeland, there are people that are just as steeped in darkness. And, 
atheistic belief, in humanistic belief, in perverted beliefs, in all kinds of spiritual darkness. And we have the light of the gospel to bring to them. And uh, God wants to use us to bring people to faith in Christ right here in Lakeland. But we have to be filled with the Spirit because it's the Spirit that gives us the passion, that gives us this drive that we want to go out and we want to see people saved. And so if I have my life, if I make it more about me than about Jesus, then what happens is I become apathetic, um, I become lazy, I'm not really concerned with spiritual things. And, and if my life is more about me than it is about Jesus, then what, what happens is I learn how to compartmentalize my faith in Christ. And I reserve it now for Sunday morning and maybe Sunday night, Wednesday night, depending on whatever church you're involved in, but we can kind of compartmentalize our Christian faith. And then we don't take it into the workplace, or we don't take it into our homes or into our neighborhood. But we need to realize that the Lord Jesus Christ is to be integrated in every part of our life. You know, people will criticize politicians because of their faith. You can't separate the two. My faith influences everything I do. Every decision I make is influenced by the indwelling Christ. And so we have to remember that. And, and unfortunately, in every church, there are way too many people that have learned how to compartmentalize their faith. <clears throat> and then, which will lead to every church, finally, having unwilling participants. Verse 13 says, Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. They moved on to the next place. John Mark left them. And that's all it says here. But we'll see in chapter 15 that uh, he wants to come back. He went back to Jerusalem. He abandoned them on this first journey. And then in chapter 15, they're getting ready to go out on their second missionary journey. Barnabas wants to bring them back and be part of the team. Saul, or Paul rather, says no. He left us once. What we're doing is serious business for the Lord. We can't afford to have somebody who's half-hearted committed. And, and, and so they had this division. And unfortunately, when we get there in chapter 15, we'll see that Saul keep calling him Saul now, I got used to calling him Saul, now it's Paul, but Paul and Barnabas, they got an argument over this, and they split, and there ended up being two teams going out, and so Paul took Silas with him, and Barnabas took John Mark with him. Now, thankfully, it was a good thing that Barnabas wanted to give John Mark a second chance, because when Paul writes his second letter to Timothy, he says, bring John Mark with you. He says he's useful for me. He, he can bless me. And so he had earned the right to be a part of the team again. He had the second chance and he must have done well. But understand that there's always going to be apathetic, indifferent people who will resist giving God complete control of their lives. And that's a given. John Mark had must have reached a point within this ministry, maybe when he saw the spiritual wickedness of Elimus and, and just saw this spiritual darkness, he must have thought to himself, I, I don't know if I'm ready for this. this. This might be a little bit more than I can bear. And so he just decided to bail and he went back to Jerusalem. He couldn't handle it. He was overwhelmed. <laughs> you know, and we all have our comfort zones. We have our little boxes where we feel safe. And John Mark must have seen the seriousness of the spiritual conflict, and he just said, whoa, this is, this is just a little bit too much for me. And he didn't want to do it anymore. Um, but he was right, because the truth of the matter is, is that it is too much for us. That's why we need the filling of the Spirit. If John Mark had been filled with the Spirit, he would have stuck with the team. He wouldn't have bailed on them and gone back to Jerusalem. But he was in the flesh, and he saw what they were, what they were facing, and he said, I, I, I can't deal with this. But if he had been filled with the Spirit, he would have stuck with the team. And so God has this passion to see his gospel going into all the world, to have a passion for his glory. And he's glorified when people hear the truth and they respond to the truth when they're saved. 
He's glorified when we can honestly say, say, God, your plan is much bigger than me, but I know the angels rejoice, and I know that you are thrilled when unbelievers put their trust in you and they repent of their sin. And so fill me, Lord, use me in winning the loss to the Lord Jesus. And I want your spirit to fill me and take control of my life. Peter put it another way. He said in 1 Peter chapter 3, Sanctify or set apart the Lord God in your heart, always being ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. But when you sanctify the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, that is similar, I guess. That, that, that's, that's like saying being filled with the Spirit. Setting Christ apart as Lord in your heart, he's in charge. I don't call the shots in my life anymore. I follow his will. I do what he wants me to do. And the Antioch church became the central point from which the first missionaries were sent because it was grounded in truth. They had godly, spirit-filled teachers and leaders. And as a result, they became a spirit-filled church. And they had a passion to see God glorified and to see people won to faith in Christ. You know, churches are closing every day. Thomas, Tom Rainier, uh, he is a former president of Lifeway Christian Resources, and he does a lot of, I'm on his email list, and he does a lot of research in ministry, in pastoral ministry and church ministries. But he estimates he said the estimates range from five to 10,000 churches close every year in America. Now, I know that's hard for us to believe, but, but that's been a statistic that I've read about consistently for many years now. And if that many churches are failing and closing, with the direction that our country is heading, we can't afford to close. God has put us here to be a light for the gospel, to make a difference for Jesus Christ. The darkness, now Lakeland is a city that really, I have to say there are more churches in Lakeland. I mean, it's almost like one on every street corner and every time I see a notice about another one starting up, it just oh, kind of baffles me. And Lord, how many, how many flavors of church can we have? You know, and they, but they just keep popping up. Now, I don't want to say that's a bad thing, but even with all the churches in Lakeland, we're still right in the middle of spiritual darkness. And we need to be the light for the world to see. If we want God to use us to reach the lost, it will only be as we allow the Holy Spirit to take full control of us, to submit to him. The church as a whole can become a beacon of gospel light, just like the church at Antioch. I'll close with this. John MacArthur said this in his commentary. He said, a spirit-filled church, a spirit-energized church, a spirit-empowered church, a church that knew the meaning of Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me. And that's the key, people, the key in any church that is going to impact the world, the key in any church that is going to move out to fulfill God's great commission, the key to any church that is going to explode, as it were, with the message of the kingdom across the globe, is that it be a spirit-controlled church. God willing, that's the kind of church I want Lakeland Bible Church to be. It's be spirit-filled. But to be a spirit-filled church, we have to be spirit-filled individually. Amen? Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word, for its clear instruction to us of our need to yield to the Holy Spirit. You've given us the Holy Spirit but, Lord, we don't always let them have control. And many, many who know the Lord Jesus, many who claim him as Savior, really don't want to give him complete control. But, Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts and that you would bring conviction to us if, we, if we've been hesitant, if we've resisted the promptings of your spirit, if we've neglected the spiritual resources of the word that you've made available to us. Lord, I pray that you'd forgive us and continue to work with us and in us so that you can work through us, so that as a spirit-filled church, we can spread the, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that you would use us to that end. 
and we ask this together in his blessed name. Amen. Well, for those of you that are with us on Facebook, I want to thank you for joining us. And if you're a believer, uh, please let the Spirit take control. He wants to use you, and that's the best way he can do it. You can try to let God use you and do it on your own flesh, in your own flesh, but uh, I guarantee you, you're going to fall flat on your face. The Spirit of God needs to control us. That way he can use us to the maximum. So if you're not a believer, then uh, I want you to consider the claims of Christ. He gave his life to save you, to forgive you of your sin, to give you the gift of eternal life. And if you want to know more, you can let that be known on the Facebook page, and we'd love to respond to that if we can. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Lord willing, we'll see you next week. God bless you.